This week, we bring you an Arizona Illustrated special, La Vaquita. We don't have enough time for the vaquita. We need serious action on the front lines right now. Gill nets are the greatest threat to marine mammals in the world. Dead whales, dead dolphins, dead sea lions, dead turtles, dead vaquitas. Sorry. It's not too late for this species. You have the potential to bring a species back from the brink. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. This week, we take you on a journey not far from here to the Sea of Cortez, where the most endangered marine mammal on Earth is fighting for survival against overwhelming odds. But first, an update on the coronavirus in Arizona. While the state's overall numbers continue to meet its benchmarks, Pima County's numbers are causing some concern. Both the number of cases per 100,000 and the positivity percentage rose over the last few weeks. Dr. Kara Christ, the state's health director, cautioned that this could be due to the addition of antigen test results of University of Arizona students as they return to Tucson. Pima County's hospital visits for COVID-like illnesses continue to decline and remain well below 10%. For more coronavirus information, including a link to the state's data dashboard, visit news.azpm.org. The United Nations says that a million species across the planet are at risk of going extinct, including one third of the world's marine mammals. The vaquita, a small porpoise that lives in the salty waters of the upper Gulf of California is poised to lead the way. This is La Vaquita. Vaquitas are only seen and living in this area. There is no other place in the world. This is their house. Vaquitas are the desert porpoise. They live in this water that's hot to me to go swimming in. They're a very endearing animal. They have beautiful dark eye rings and black lipstick. I have seen three vaquitas. Unfortunately, every single vaquita I have seen has been dead. I'm going to show you our skull collection that has a vaquita skull. And you can see how tiny it is. This is a vaquita. Actually was confiscated at the border in 1983. I actually did part of my PhD thesis on vaquitas many years ago, 1991. The first big abundance estimate was in 1997. Interestingly, probably most of the vaquitas were gone before we did that first abundance estimate. So if you imagine that there were 4,000, we were down to 600 by the time we even did the first abundance estimate. A 
between 1997 and 2008, we lost over 50% of them. So then we were down to roughly 200 of them. So that is about an 8% per year decline, which at the time was a shocking level of decline, as large a decline as has been recorded for any marine mammal. But the worst was yet to come. The population started declining somewhere between 40 and 50% per year, starting in about 2011. That, of course, is a catastrophe more than anything else. If you compare with the historic population back in 1940, we have less than 1% of that original population. Right? The vaquitas like dolphins emit these clicks, a collocation clicks that are easily recordable in some electronic equipment. Back in 2011, 2012, 2013, there was a lot, a lot of Akita signals in the data. It took something like 15 days to analyze that data. Now we can do that in one day <laughs> because there are no signals of Akita. When you press the, the click, go away with no Akitas at all in many of the sites where Akitas used to be. Totoaba is an endangered species, also endemic of this area. It's a sea bass. They can measure almost two meters. They have the similar size of the vaquita. Tail, you see how it has like an S shape? Yeah. Tail is green. Okay, we have it. We got it. Woo! Uh, swim bladders are very commonly consumed by the Chinese public. Like it's sort of generally seen as a medicinal thing, but the swim bladder from the Totoaba is like the king of the swim bladders. It's meant to be magical in some senses. The Totoaba is also a red list, critically endangered animal. And so as the Totoaba gets extinct, the price for the swim bladders gets higher. It's essentially bought and traded like gold. So when we find a net, we will grapple it and we leave the net until it's coming at the water level. Always be vigilant, even if you are the third one to touch the net, the two other ones may have missed something. 
we don't have time to say, please, can you do, just say, do that. And, uh, but it's not because I hate you, I love you all. We're a non-violent organization, we're aggressive, but we're non-violent, that's the main aspect of the organization. So our main weapon against poaching, illegal fishing, and any of these activities worldwide is our camera. And with drones, that just takes, you know, the camera, instead of being on the ship, we actually get to put it right over the top of a poaching boat and highlight that this is actually an issue so that it can't be swept under the rug. Every day we go out in high season, we can have 40, 60 or 80 pangas fishing illegally inside the refuge, easy. The one that we can spot in a range of a few miles around our boat and the area is way bigger than that. So we're talking about hundreds probably fishing illegally in high season. The cartels are involved in the, in the aspect they're using the same ways to move the swim bladders out from Mexico that they use with the drugs. And also they lend the money to the fishermen to buy the gear, the fishing gear. Because it's a lot of money, it's more money than drugs. The fishermen, of course, don't receive that money, but anyway, they receive a lot of money compared to any other kind of species they're fishing. Uh, I receive threats sometimes uh, when I'm driving. I have vehicles coming, trying to take me out of the road, stuff like that. So yeah, we know they're here, we know they're involved, but it's nothing we can do about it. I mean, our goal is just the vaquita, and we're gonna keep doing that. Fish coming up, fish coming up. All right, it dropped off. Side. Let's see what bag. This is the type of net that we are pulling out. You can see that the mesh is really big. You can pass your hand really easy there. They're made for totoaba. And because the vaquita has the same size of the totoaba, more or less, they get entangled here really easy. So that's why it's so dangerous for the vaquita. So if you can see, this is just almost like two weeks of work. All these bags contain nets. So each bag can weigh around 250 kilos just in fishing gear. Nets, we have around 27 at the moment, between all these bags. And this one just contain leads. I don't know if we can see here, it's really heavy. Just the lead of the nets. All this lead maintain the net completely vertical in the bottom. Gill nets are the greatest threat to marine mammals in the world by far. It's not that I denigrate climate change and ship strike, but gill nets kill hundreds of thousands, probably millions of animals every single year. They are driving these species extinct. Okay, we are uh, ready when you are ready. So right now, we are on um, night patrol, usual deal for us. The main deal with the poachers is they try to hide the nets from us, because each net for them is a huge amount of money. It's up to $3,000 per net. So we go up and down the refuge trying to find any boats laying nets. We log their positions. We either launch drones to investigate what they're doing or just continually monitor their activities monitor where exactly they stop, and then we use our sonar after that to go over those points and see if there's any submerged nets left underneath the surface, and then we can pick them up. Now we're concentrating in a small area inside the refuge. It's a little rectangle, and that area is very specific because the latest survey, we spot more vaquitas in that specific area. So we are focusing all our effort in removing nets and try to keep the fishermen outside of that area. 
We don't have enough time for the Vaquita. We need serious action on the front lines right now in terms of stopping the trafficking, stopping the nets going in in the first place, and pulling the nets out of the refuge. Because there's not enough time to try change the hearts and minds of China, which could take years. We've taken over a thousand nets out of the ocean, and that's over 170 kilometers a net. That's to space and back and to space again, out of this tiny little area in the Sea of Cortez. So there's sort of a, a simultaneous double side to every single day. Whenever we do an operation and we get like 14, 15 nets in a day, one, that's $30,000 of illegal fishing gear alone that we've just taken. So that's good. That means in just fishing gear and, and actual lost profits for this organized crime, that's, that's a huge amount of money that they lose from us doing that. And then simultaneously, whenever you take these nets out, then sometimes you get a live shark, a live ray, a live turtle, a live whale that we can then free from this net. Now, the double-edged bad day to this is that those nets exist. And unfortunately, the Sea Shepherd crew has had to crawl through dead whales, dead dolphins, dead sea lions, dead turtles, dead vaquitas that we find in these nets. So it's, it's, it's a great day whenever we get to free animals, but also so often that's not the case. Todo el sector pesquero regularizado. Decidimos de común acuerdo salirnos del mar para que dejarle el mar limpio, por el mar de alguna manera, de pandas legales, para que el gobierno federal hiciera un trabajo de limpieza de las pangas ilegales. Era suficiente para vivir tranquilamente, sin necesidad de estar este, pues con la tentación de irnos a pescar. ¿Por qué? Porque sabíamos que teníamos que proteger un animalito, que es la vaquita marina. The ban on gill nets actually had no detectable effect on the illegal Totoaba fishing. The Navy is set up for foreign invaders. They couldn't take forceful action against people who were brazenly, flagrantly violating the law. Once that was clear, they ceased to be a real enforcement body. Desgraciadamente, creo que fue un error que cometimos tanto el gobierno como nosotros el habernos salido del mar, porque le dejamos el mar de Cortés libre a la pesca ilegal. Es por eso que nos hicimos a la mar. El día 24 de septiembre de este año, yo en lo personal, yo como, como federación, yo les di el banderazo para que las pangas legales salieran a trabajar. ¿Por qué razón? Porque yo no tenía cómo decirles, oye, no salgas. ¿Y, y qué les decía con las familias? ¿Qué les llevaban a comer los padres de familia, los pescadores? Por eso fue que yo, lo, yo me eché la responsabilidad de pararme en el muelle y decirle a compañeros salgan a pescar y que Dios los bendiga. We are just trying to work with them and explain to them to at least respect the small rectangle that is the critical area because we know the concentration of vaquita has been most spot over there. So we are trying to get the attention on that to at least to respect that specific area if they don't want to respect the full refuge, which I also understand they've been without going to fish for a long time, 
they stopped receiving money from the government like I think 11, 12 months ago. So I know the desperation of the fishermen. They just want to do their job. I can understand that it's difficult to, to develop a strategy. When you have all this combination of illegal fishing of Totoaba, the angry of the people, new administration, and things like that. So I really hope that they come with a, a strategy that includes the support for the town, for the legal fishing activity, and to combat effectively the illegal fishing of Totoaba developing alternative fishing methods and developing alternative livelihoods were really the only way for vaquitas to survive in those communities. And of course, that's quite outside the realm of a conservation biologist that takes governmental will to make the hard changes that need to be made. It takes economists, it takes sociologists, and those parts have all been lacking. Over the years, the recovery team has talked about whether taking vaquitas into captivity should be part of our conservation strategies. And the team has just felt that the best chance for vaquitas was in the wild and that getting rid of gill nets was a solvable problem and that we should just focus on that. And then the Totoaba catastrophe hit. And so it started to look like something that was feasible um, for vaquitas and perhaps necessary. And so this vaquita CPR was set up to basically orchestrate this process very rapidly. And with 90 scientists from nine different countries, all the expertise that we could marshal to try to make this Hail Mary activity work. We were very good at finding them. We were very good at catching them. But unfortunately, the two animals that we caught both reacted very badly to being handled. They experienced what uh, a lot of animals that are captured for the first time experience, which is shock, capture myopathy. The first individual was a six-month-old, and she was released back in the area where we had captured the calf and the mother. And then the second one was an adult female, and she seemed to be doing well, and then she died. That was the end, because unfortunately, the, the vets felt they couldn't expect a better outcome with the next capture. And with only tens of animals left, rather than hundreds of animals, um, there wasn't really space to learn. And so it was a really tragic ending. What was that like being, being there for that death? Heartbreaking. Sorry. Yeah, it was a terrible, scarring experience for all of us. There is so few vaquita left, but we have the real potential right now. It's not too late for this species. There's enough genetic diversity within this species that it can come back, and what a success story that would be for conservation. If conservation is done right, and it's done at the correct time, and it's done with enough strength, you have the potential to bring a species back from the brink. And we've seen this with other species in history, like the San Diego Harbor seal. 
uh, every rhino that you see in most zoos comes from a population of seven. So there is a potential for species to come back from these low numbers and thrive. It's not the vaquita itself, it's, it's our character as nation in taking care of in this particular easy problem for me to solve and we cannot do it, what can we expect of real problems? The most important thing uh, that needs to be done to save vaquitas right now is to clearly mark off the area, the small area, where the last vaquitas are remaining, uh, the, that's called the zero tolerance area, and to work with the fishermen to get them to not fish there. We're really hopeful about the vaquita is gonna survive. As sea chipper, we're not gonna step back, we're not gonna move from the area. We are here to stay all the time that is needed to save the vaquita. I think these animals, these last vaquitas, are the survivors. They're the ones that have had a bad experience, learned from it, um, and are extra careful around nets. I think if they're protected and guarded, um, they have a real chance. Gracias a Dios tuve esa oportunidad en su momento que anduve pescando, de poder conocerlo, de poder vivirla así, de mirarla de cerquita. Es una monería, es una, es una hermosura que te da ternura mirarla. Cuando llega a salir del agua, te da ternura mirarla con esos ojotes, esas manchas que anda como si estuviera riéndose contigo. Entonces, el que es pescador bien, bien en forma, no le da por, por hacerle daño, al contrario. Entonces nosotros, fue un trabajo arduo con todo el sector pesquero de hacerles entender que había que cuidarla. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. And be sure to join us next week when we unveil a whole new look and all new stories. I'm Tom McNamara. See you then.